I was very successful in science, but I was not very successful in all my personal life experiences. Uh, and life was a struggle and I, uh, I, I just felt insecure in some level without knowing about it. And um, my programming didn't really give me a good view of myself. And when I started to understand the nature that I'm not my creative conscious mind's wishes and desires, my spiritual connection, I am the program playing through the subconscious mind and that my program was off and that when I learned how to rewrite the program, I rewrote the entire character of my life. Uh, look, um, the brain is a computer. That's a fact, okay? It's the most fabulous computer humans have ever experienced and we can't even match it. Well, what's interesting about it, it functions exactly the same as the laptop computers with the same systems, etc. And I go, what's relevant is that if you buy a brand new computer, in the old days especially, you come home, you plug it in, you push start, and the screen boots up, and we say, ready. And I go, yeah, but you can't do anything until you put programs in. I go, this is exactly the same for the human computer. It boots up in the last trimester of pregnancy, but it's not functional in consciousness until programs are installed, which takes seven years of programming. I love my life so much, you won't believe it. You know, it's like, and I, I didn't start that way at all. And I celebrate the fact that, well, I'm 80, I'm enjoying everything as much as when I was 40, if not better. And uh, life is beautiful. Do you, do you mind to share, like, how, how come that you had such a big turnaround in it? Like, what happened that you, that, that you went from, you know, what you said in the beginning here? It didn't start out like that. No, it didn't start out that way. I was, uh, I was very successful in science, but I was not very successful at all in my personal life experiences. Uh, and life was a struggle, and I, um, I, I just felt insecure in some level without knowing about it at some point. And um, my programming didn't really give me a good view of myself. And when I started to understand the nature that uh, I'm not my creative conscious mind's wishes and desires, my spiritual connection, I am the program playing through the subconscious mind, and that my program was off. And that when I learned how to rewrite the program, I rewrote the entire character of my life. Uh, look, um, the brain is a computer. That's a fact, okay? Yeah. It's the most fabulous computer humans have ever experienced, and we can't even match it. But what's interesting about it, it functions exactly the same as the laptop computers with the same systems, et cetera. And I go, what's relevant is that if you buy a brand new computer, in the old days especially, you come home, you plug it in, you push start, and the screen boots up, and we say, ready. And I go, yeah, but you can't do anything until you put programs in. I go, this is exactly the same for the human computer. It boots up in the last trimester of pregnancy, but it's not functional in consciousness until programs are installed, which takes seven years of programming. And during that programming time, the brain is not operating predominantly at a higher vibration called consciousness, self-awareness. It's operating in a state called theta, which is characterized as imagination, which is interesting because this is how kids mix the real world and the imaginary world seamlessly. You know, uh, they're riding a broom in the kid's mind. It's not a broom. It's a horse. The mother says, give me the broom. The kid looks at the, like, what are you talking about? Because it's not even concept that it's a broom. Uh, I always talk about the famous tea party. They pour nothing into the cup. They drink nothing. And then it was the best tea they ever had in their life. Theta. But theta is hypnosis. And the reason for hypnosis is how many rules do you have to know to become a functional member of a family and even more rules to become a functional member of a community? You have to know rules. You just don't go out and do whatever the hell you want. I say, when does a child learn the rules? I say an infant can't read the book, an infant can't go to the school, uh, and yet it has to really pick up the rules. So nature designed the first seven years of the brain's function at a lower vibration of consciousness called theta, and theta uh, is a state of hypnosis. So I say, so we get our fundamental programs of how to be a member of a family and a community by simply observing other people who are in that role and then you download their behavior, and that's how you learn how to do it, okay? So the programs in your subconscious mind predominantly didn't come from you, your wishes, your personal desires. It came from observing other people. 
And if they had a dysfunction, well, then you could download that dysfunction. I downloaded a dysfunction because my mother and father didn't have a very good relationship. My programming as a child is to watch my father and download his behavior because that's going to be what I'm going to use. Well, I downloaded dysfunctional behavior. I go, so what was the consequence? I said, I couldn't get a damn relationship off the ground for over 40 years because every time I start to get into a relationship, the programming that my father put into, you know, that I've downloaded from my father started to manifest and any potential partner looked at me and go, that program sucks. You know, I'm not going to be here for that. <laughs> yeah. And and, uh, and therefore, I couldn't get into a relationship, but I, these programs are invisible to us. And I go, what do you mean invisible? Well, the whole idea is we have the conscious creative mind connected to our spirituality, and we also have the subconscious mind, which is the equivalent of the hard drive in the computer. It's programs. It's all it is, just programs, habits, okay? The conscious creative mind is the one that can manifest things like wishes and desires, imagination, all that kind of stuff like that. So I say, well, if I'm operating from my conscious creative mind, shouldn't I be able to manifest and create the world I like? Because that's its function. I go, yes. But the problem is the conscious mind can do two things. And this is what people don't understand. And the whole problem comes from this. I go, what is it? Well, the conscious mind can be the creator mind. I can manifest my life based on my wishes and desires. I go, yeah, we can do that. But then the conscious mind can also think. And Julian, this is the big issue and the whole reason I say why. Because thinking is not looking out. Thinking is looking in. And so if you're thinking, by definition, you're not paying attention with your conscious mind to the outside world. You're inside looking for a thought. I go, so what's the point? I go, well, let's say you're driving the car. And we do this. And all of a sudden, we start thinking. I go, well, then you're not looking out the windshield anymore. You're inside your head thinking about something. The road's still going. The car's still going. You're not paying attention to what's you're going on. You're the person on the red stoplight who doesn't start driving if you're stuck in they're thinking. Gone. They're not even there. You know, it, it takes <clears throat> the problem is subconscious not only has the programs in it, but subconscious is autopilot. I go, what does that mean? I said, well, when you're thinking, you're not looking out your vision into the world. You're looking inside. Uh, if you're driving the car, as we just said, then you start thinking. You're not looking out the windshield. And yet you seem to be safe and everything's driving okay. I go, because autopilot, which knows how to drive the car program, steps in and takes over. And I go, so what's the point about that? I go, well, yeah. Then I say, well, how much thinking are you doing? Because that determines how much of your life is being coming from a program. Well, scientists have figured out it's about 95% of the time. So I think, wait, if I'm thinking 95% of the time, then I'm only creating my life 5%. I go, 95% of my life while I'm thinking is coming from the program. It's not me. It's the programs I downloaded from other people. So am I being me? No, I'm being a program. And if you come with dysfunctional programs, 60% of almost all of our pro of programming is dysfunctional and disempowering, self-sabotaging. If 95% of your life is coming from that, then you can all of a sudden say, why am I struggling? I'm a creator. If I'm the creator, then why the hell am I struggling? And why would I create this, this mess? I go, well, you didn't create that mess. Your subconscious did. I said, yeah, but where did it get the program to do that? I said, it downloaded. It observed how things operate and who's in charge and how things work. And the next thing you know, you're not being you. You're just playing whatever you were downloaded to, to be. And, and, and we lost our power. And so we see the, the state of the world, right? Where a, a lot of people run around exactly like this. And it, it what? turns into this. We're lost, in, <laughs> we're lost in the sauce, right? And so my question here is, is Bruce, you know, you just said it. We are, we are creators. Yes. But then we only use a small capacity of our creative power. So... What, maybe we should distinguish that we, as creators, we have to become aware that the subconscious, the conscious, the external factors, all of these are parts of the puzzle. How do you go about integrating the subconscious mind, right, the conscious mind, and the environmental layers that affect our epigenetics? Well, the first thing is this. We must own the simple reality. We are creators. Every human is a creator that we are manifesting the character and expression of our lives. Well, it depends on if you're manifesting it from the conscious mind, which is wishes and desires, or you're manifesting your life from programs, which you got from other people. 
And then, of course, we just mentioned that science has recognized 95% is coming from that program. So I said, well, what are my programs? I go, well, listen, you don't know what your programs are. I go, what do you mean? I say, you weren't conscious when these programs were being installed. I say that you were already being programmed before you're born. The last three months of life in the womb, you are being programmed. And then you're programmed for seven years. So I say, well, okay, well, what program did you get when you were in the womb? And the answer is, well, how do I know? I wasn't conscious. I go, okay, but you were programmed a whole year from zero to one. Tell me what program you got when you were zero. Uh, I'm a, I wasn't conscious. I don't remember, yeah. Uh, there is no memory because you weren't there. And uh, all the way up, and especially, you know, from zero to one, one to two, two to three. By the time three, you start to get memories that you can remember back that something was going on. But you can't tell me your program you got when you're one. It's fundamentally carrying out 95% of your life. I go, oh, my God, how am I going to know what my programs are? I don't know what they are. And, and then I love it because the answer is, well, 95% of your life is the program. I go, oh, then your life is a printout of your program. I go, so what does that mean? So, well, just look at your life right now. Simple point. The things you like that come into your life, well, they come in because you have programs to acknowledge those things. But, and this is the big one. The things you wish for or desire and your struggle to manifest, whether it's health, relationships, good job, I don't care what it is, and you're struggling to manifest those things, then why are you having trouble? Why do you have to work hard? Why do you have to sweat over it? What are you trying to do? And I go, the programs that you have are preventing you from getting to that <clears throat> destination you wish for. And therefore, I, I, want to, I want this. So I said, what are you going to do? Work hard. Sweat over it. Put a lot of effort into it. You can make it. I go, yeah. why am I working so hard? And the answer is because the program about that destination doesn't support it. And you're trying to override it. And I go, the subconscious mind, A, is a million times more powerful a processor than the conscious mind. So the conscious mind has got this little tiny power supply, and it's trying to rework <laughs> the subconscious program. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Can't do it. Okay? You struggle. That's where the struggle comes from. So basically, it says, then what are my programs? I don't know. And I go, yes, you do. For this reason, 95% of your life is the program. Your life is a printout of your programs. Tell me where you're struggling, and I'll tell you where you have a problem in the program. That struggle is representing a problem, whether it's health or relationship, job, whatever the hell it is. And so I say, so why is this important? If you understand where the program is, you can change the program. If you don't understand where the program is, it's like, well, I don't know what's going on, man. I, I have no idea. <laughs> All I, It's like, everything's happening. And, and, and I've been, Julian, I've been saying the same same little metaphor here uh, for, for 40 years. But uh, yeah. I got to say it again, and you probably heard me say it, and it's this. You have a friend. You know your friend's behavior very, very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as the parent. So you offer, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I go, what do you mean? Because I know what he's going to say, and you already know what he's going to say. How can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. Well, in his conscious mind, no, he's nothing like his dad. In his subconscious mind, he is his dad. And the idea is, well, why can't he see that he's like his dad? And I say, why is he playing the program? And the answer is simply this, because he's thinking, and therefore whatever behavior is coming out, he doesn't see it. It's automatic, program, boom, subconscious. And so everybody else can see Bill's behavior. Bill can't see his behavior because when he's playing those programs, he's only doing it because he's not paying attention. And therefore, everybody else can see Bill's like his dad. Bill's the one going, what do you mean? I'm not like my dad because he doesn't see his own behavior. Now comes the big one, Julia, and that is this. We are all Bill. Ah! We are all Bill. Absolutely. <laughs> the question is how and when, when we become aware of this, how do we change it? What's the oh, entry yeah. point it's to go of, back into the program and subconscious mind? It's funny because most of my career research which led me to the understanding of the new science called epigenetics, how mind controls genes. Um, it was all based on cell research, biochemistry, cellular functions, all these kinds of things like this. 
And when I followed the lineage, I got to the point, oh my God, uh, the brain is the controlling factor of the genes and the brain has the conscious part and the subconscious part. And and I got to that point going, oh my God. And then I find out, of course, the subconscious is running the show. And I go, oh my God. And I tell people, I go to the audience and I say, how does life work? And I show them. And I get to the end and I say, yeah, you got the conscious creative mind and the one with the programs running the show. And always the first question always irritated the hell out of me because the first question was, well, how do I change the subconscious? I go, I thought the whole science coming from the cells to the subconscious was this great story. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah. How do I change it? I felt always disempowered because it was sort of like nobody asked anything about how it all worked. You know, they just ignore that. Just tell me how to get out. I didn't realize until uh, one day I was uh, giving a program in Colorado and uh, and I met this guy, Rob Williams, who I didn't know. Uh, I had just given my my talk. And of course, the first question is, how do I change it? And of course, I walked away going, nobody cared about the science. They just want me to change it. And I'm, I'm walking back to my desk being dejected again, because again, I thought the science was fabulous. And as I'm walking back, I hear the voice behind me. I'm going to show you how to change those beliefs I was talking about. So I turn around going, oh, I'm going to watch this. And I thought, mm. pretty ballsy. I, what do you mean? I said, he's going to change somebody's beliefs here in the lecture hall right here? Yeah. So uh, uh, I'll never forget it because uh, uh, he said, who wants to change the belief? Well, out of 400 people, at least 390 <laughs> raised their all hand. I want to change the belief. I saw this person. He saw this person. And this being Rob Williams, who's the presenter. Uh, and I said, I saw, what was that person? What was she doing? She was going like this. Uh, you know, not sure, she, you know, like this. Well, he caught, uh, she caught his attention. I saw it. And I saw him and he said, okay, you, tell us your name and what you want to change. And she just got red. She, nothing, no word, nothing. She was just like glowing red. He had to walk into the audience, get down next to her and say, well, what's your name and what do you want to change? She says, my name is Pauline and I can't speak in public. I go, well, that's pretty damn obvious. She she couldn't even say her name. So I'm watching this and I'm thinking, okay, this guy's going to change this woman's belief while we're all sitting here watching this stuff like this. He went through a process, which is referred to as the Psyche process. And it took maybe 10, 15, not more than 15, 10 minutes to 15 minutes to do the process. In the final stage, she's sitting in a chair and and they finish the process and she stands up and he puts his arm on her shoulder, faces her toward the audience. I'm watching this after they do this whole process. And he turns her toward the audience and he said, "Uh, Pauline, why don't you describe to the audience what you just experienced? The moment he took his arm off her shoulder, she started talking, walking up and down the stage, talking about her life here, what happened here, going on and on. Everybody in the audience like me is going, here's a woman who couldn't even say her name. And the fun part was because Rob said, Pauline, please sit down. You're using my lecture time. Uh, he had to ask her to shut up. <laughs> I went, whoa. I since found out, especially in my own life, where I had limitations in my subconscious programming that prevented me from reaching what I was looking for, that I could rewrite those programmings, okay? I have rewritten those programs to the extent of what? I've taken the wishes and desires of my creative conscious mind and turned them into programs in my subconscious mind. I go, so what? I go, well, 95% of the day, I'm going toward wishes and desires without even thinking about it. My subconscious behavior is going to take me there whether I'm paying attention or I'm not paying attention. And the result is, look, I downloaded programming as that kid. I watched my father as a the trying to match. I'm going to, you know, he's the model that I'm trying to make. So I watched my father's behavior, dysfunctional relationship with my mom. I downloaded that. And then for 40 years, every time I try to get off into a relationship, that dysfunctional behavior from my subconscious would show up, boom, relationship gone. (laughs) And then I saw the problem and I rewrote it. How long? Just like Pauline, 10, 15 minutes. And I walked away and I sit here today, tell you a simple fact. After doing this, I met my partner, Margaret. 
and we are celebrating 28 years of honeymoon every day. And I go, how'd you do that? I said, because both of us knew about the subconscious programming and how it could interfere. Well, most people don't know this. And I say, so what if most people don't know it? And I say, well, they're in this loving relationship, which I'll get to in a second. And then all of a sudden, some of this programming comes out from the subconscious and they look at it and the recipient of hearing this goes, who are you? What kind of behavior is that? Without recognizing the person who just said that behavior didn't even hear it themselves. It starts an argument. I say, and the longer people are together, the more these subconscious programs show up, the more they show up, the more the separation, the honeymoon disappears first, and then 50% of the marriage is out the window. Why? It's not the person I fell in love with. I go, wait, then who was the person you fell in love? And this is, I like this part, because the movie The Matrix is not science fiction. It's a documentary. And I go, why? Because the premise is everybody's been programmed. I go, oh, that's established. All humans are programmed for seven years. But in the movie, they had something called the red pill. You get out of the program. And I go, you get the choice. The science has recognized that we have taken that red pill. Almost everybody online that's hearing us has taken that red pill at least once. I go, what is it? The red pill is falling in love. I go, why is that the red pill? And the answer is this. Why are we playing programs? And the reason we're playing programs is because the conscious mind is thinking. I say, but then what happens when you fall in love? I say, the conscious mind stops thinking. Why? Because what you've been looking for is in front of your face. It's not time to think. It's time to be there. So it's called uh, being mindful, being present. I go, what does that mean? I say, I am so enjoying being with this person that I'm not thinking, I'm just enjoying it. I'm here, I'm living it, I'm enjoying it. I say, oh, well, you stop thinking. I said, then why? I said, well, when you stop thinking, you don't play the program. And then I say, well, then what's creating your life? I said, the conscious mind, that's the one with wishes and desires. That's why when two people come together, stop playing their programs and start collectively together manifesting wishes and desires, the world changes. The world becomes heaven on earth. You could be blah, 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 meet this person, and 24 hours later, oh, life is so beautiful. Life is great. I love life. Life is wonderful. I'm having to love, 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 love. And I go, 24 hours? What the hell happened? I go, you stopped playing programs and started using the conscious mind as the creator rather than the subconscious. Conscious has wishes and desires. What do you think two people do when they come together? and start manifesting wishes and desires. A honeymoon. I go, that's great. And how long does it last? I say, well, as long as you start, you don't start thinking a lot, because the moment you start thinking, then the behavior isn't you. The behavior is that subconscious program. And in my case, that would be my father's behavior, and that would throw a monkey wrench into the relationship until I rewrote the program. What did I write? What new programs? I said, wishes and desires. What do I want? Okay, then make a program out of it. I go, significance? The subconscious is creating your life every day 95% of the time anyway. Wouldn't it be nice if your subconscious had the same wishes and desires as your conscious mind? Because then whether you're paying attention or not, whether you're paying attention or not, the subconscious mind is going to take you to the same place as the conscious mind. So now you're operating 100% of the time in creating wishes and desires when you change those programs. I'd love to also talk more about the science, and I'll, I have a little story about that a little later in this episode. But let's 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 go one level deeper here, Bruce. So you said you created a program out of your conscious mind's wishes and beliefs. Yes. How did you go about this? So I, what I understand is psyche is one of the ways to go in there and remove certain blockages. Yeah. Right. Not and then remove, how did you create re a new re program? Not remove, rewrite this. Uh, uh, rewrite. Hard. Okay. Simple point. Subconscious hard drive. It's got. Habits. Well, a habit is a program. I go, yeah, it's got programs. Okay. And I go, well, what if you want to change the program? I go, well, here's what you can do. What most people do is talk to yourself. Oh, don't do this anymore. Let's, so, let's, let's be better at this. Let's work on this. Let's do this. And I go, who are you talking to? Oh, I'm talking to the subconscious mind. I go, it's a hard drive. There's nobody in there. Who are you talking to? Nobody. 
I said, oh, that's why it doesn't change. I go, yeah, that's why there's nobody in there to talk to. I said, if that worked, then talk to your computer and see if the hard drive changes because you asked it to change. It's not going to change. You got to push the record button. I go, there's a record button. I go, yes. And if you don't push the record button, the hard drive is not going to change. So I said, well, what's the record button? I said, well, there's actually three ways to change the subconscious. Two of them are the ways you got the programs in the first place. I said, well, what are they? I said, when did you get the basic programs? First seven years. So how'd you get them? Because my brain wasn't functioning at the higher vibration of consciousness, putting wires on your head that you can read the vibration of the brain. It was functioning at a lower vibration called theta, just below consciousness. Theta uh, is imagination and character. This is why I said uh, the the kid riding a broom, imagination in theta, it's the horse. It's not a it's not a broom anymore. The mother says, "Give me the broom." The kid's like, "I don't know what you're talking about. This is a horse." Okay, so theta is imagination and hypnosis, and so I say, if you can get back into theta, then you can download new programs. I go, "Oh, do I have to see a hypnotherapist?" I go, "No, you know why." Your brain has different levels of vibration. The level, hopefully, that we're on and our audience is on right now is a higher vibration called beta, which is thinking consciousness. But when you go home and relax in the evening and you're just taking, you know, quieting yourself down, the vibration lowers to another level called alpha, from beta to alpha. Alpha is calm consciousness. But the moment you fall asleep, the vibration then drops to the next level called theta. Well, theta is no consciousness. That just went to sleep. Theta is hypnosis. So if you put earbuds or earphones on at night and play a program of what you want to be true, the conscious mind's not even paying attention. The conscious mind's sleeping. It's not even there. But the subconscious mind in theta is in download. So I can do self-hypnosis by putting on earbuds, earphones, and then going to bed and having the program play. Well, if you push start and the program is playing while you're awake, of course, that's why you can push the button. You'll hear some of the program. But the moment you actually fall asleep. As you fall asleep, yeah. The, the conscious mind doesn't hear anything anymore. But the subconscious mind is still working and downloading. Starting to record. Because so, you're hitting that record button by entering theta. Uh, so, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and, and the conscious mind's totally unaware, just like it was in the first seven years. It's still just going into the subconscious as a download. Uh, and, and it's very important, uh, the programs that you play. Now, they're available in self-help bookstores and stuff like that. You know, change, change your things like that. You can make your own. <laughs> You can make your own. I was just about to ask, how, how did you go about it? Did you make your own? You recorded the, you the recorded, mantras that you wanted to, to put into your subconscious? Yes, you record the life you want as if you already have it. Meaning, uh, let's say uh, I'm sick and I want to be healthy. I don't write, I will be healthy. That's not, that's not a good program. I say, why? I say, well, let's record it right now. Today, I will be healthy. Now I say, let's come back next year and let's, how's that program? I will be healthy. I say, it's so a whole year. You still will be. You didn't get there. I go, why? Because you're projecting a future that's not going to manifest. So what you do is, even if you're sick as a dog, you program, I am healthy. And I go, why? Because the function of the brain is to take the consciousness and manifest it. If I am unhealthy physiologically, but I now put a program in that I am healthy, then the job of the brain is to manifest health. That's how you do it manifest relationships, manifest uh, a job, manifest. Well, you have to say, I have those things because the function of the brain is to take the consciousness and manifest it as a reality. So uh, mm. you can do your That's own. That's a big one. You can that do is the own. actual function of the brain, right? So okay. the brain being a computer in that sense is that is exactly where it, where it comes to play. So I think it's an important distinction. You, you made it really clear. Thinking is a very small capacity of our brain going inward, but actually the true function of it is to help us manifest from the recording of the subconscious. Well, yeah, but if the recording is defective in the beginning, <clears throat> 60%, 60% of all the people out here, you and me and everybody else, 
60% of the original downloaded programs are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. This is psychologists understanding these programs. And I go, so what's the point? I go, 60% of the programs are, are, are taking away the character and quality I want. I say, well, you've got to change those programs. Then that's where I say, number one, how can I change it? And I say, well, self-hypnosis. That's how you got your program in the first place, hypnosis, just by watching your parent downloading, okay? So I say, that's number one. I say, yeah, but you know, that only works for the first seven years. But you still learn programs after seven. I go, how'd you do that? I say, practice, habituation. I say, you learned how to drive a car. You had to practice driving right. a car. And the more you practice something, the more it becomes downloaded to the extent when you practice it enough, you don't have to think about it anymore. Why? You just have to push play and the program will play. I can drive a car without thinking about it. Well, in fact, most of the time I do. <laughs> Why? Because I'm driving, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go here and do this, or I'm talking to somebody in the car. I'm not paying attention. And yet the car is going where it's supposed to go at the speed limit, no accidents and all that. And I go, well, then who's controlling? I go, the subconscious is a million times more powerful than the conscious mind anyway. It knows how to drive the car better than you have to drive the car. So the point is, are we running our lives? And the answer is 5%. How do I change it? Number one, how'd you get it? It's hypnosis, okay? Then I say, well, what happens after age seven? Because you're not in hypnosis, but you still learn to program. I go, oh, part two, you want to change something, you make a habit. I go, what do you mean make a habit? Repetition. You got to practice something repeated, 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 repeated to a point that the subconscious now has habituated that behavior. It knows the habit. Because once it's got the habit, you don't have to teach it anymore. It's already downloaded. It knows how to do it. So uh, you want to drive a car? You got to practice driving the car. You want to play an instrument? Oh, you got to practice playing the instrument. You want to do a sport? You got to practice doing the sport. I go, Practice is a process of habituation. Make a habit, practice it, okay? So those are the two natural ways that we put programs into the system. And you can do this anytime. You can make a new habit. Anytime you feel like behaving and repeating that behavior and repeating that behavior and repeating, that will make a habit. The last change is something brand new. I think it was, uh, you know, there's a, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I go, necessity, we need to change our behavior very quickly. I go, what do we mean? Because nature is revealing to us that the behavior that we've been operating from, the programs that we have downloaded and continue to carry out, are self-destructive. We're destroying the environment, and people don't recognize we came from the environment. If the environment's not here, we're not we here. We won't be here. Uh, a NASA scientist uh, put a date on this thing. They say within the next 20 years, there will be, and let me emphasize the word, irreversible collapse of civilization. Irreversible, I emphasize, means there's no going back to another way. Those ways were problematic. They got us to here now. You want to go future, you don't go back, you make new. So uh, civilization is collapsing. I go. Well, yeah, uh, watch the news, surf the web, look out your window, <laughs> it's falling apart. Whether it's economic, political, social, racial, religious, gender, chaos is everywhere. And I go, well, why is all the chaos? I say, those are the trees in a bigger forest. I say, what's the forest called? And the forest is called extinction. <laughs> I go, what do you mean? We have so undermined the web of life and it's not, that's the scientist said, in 20 years, we're going to face a collapse because human behavior is living beyond the means of the planet. I go, what, do you, I go, what does that mean? I go, science has recognized a very important fact that if we want to keep civilization working just today, just say, let's keep it today. Just This is where we're going to keep it. It takes 1.6 planet Earths to provide for today's needs. I go, well, there's a problem. We don't have an extra 0.6 Earth. We've been borrowing on the future, extracting the planet, destroying the environment to have what we want today at the cost of destroying the web of life. And we are the web of life. 
and it's failing, and humans are being put on notice by Mother Nature. You guys either learn to live in harmony with nature or forget it because I don't need humans here. They're a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, 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 and this is why we're facing a collapse, and a simple reason is this. You can't put Band-Aids on the existing system. It's the problem. The only way you can solve the problem, Buckminster Fuller said at the future, is he said, you don't go in and try to change the world. You step outside, you create the new world. And this is why your job is so important, Julian, because you are the person who is bringing a new world interface into the public domain. If people don't hear it, they don't know it. Uh, and so I want to thank you for letting me use your program as a soapbox to talk about what I want to talk about. But I want to thank you because you are bringing people to the forefront whose information uh, is required for us to make that leap from the failing civilization to the new civilization. And I want people to recognize something because most of them are still holding on to the one that's there. Oh, my God, it's falling apart. I go... That's your problem. You have to let go of that. So you can't change it. You have to step outside and create the new one. Uh, and thank you, Julian, because there's knowledge available how to do this. Is it given to the public? Not by conventional resources, because they like the status quo. The newspaper is not telling you about the stuff we talk about. Newspaper is telling you you're in the fear oh, loop. Yeah, you got fear here because fear takes away your power biochemically. The stress hormones shut down consciousness as one of the functions of uh, dealing with a stress response. Don't think, react. Reaction is not thinking. And the stress hormones that are running in everybody's body these days is making them less intelligent. And therefore- That's why we got to remember to breathe, right? Because when we remember to breathe, we, we kind of are- able to step into another part of ourselves or even able to step out of that fear response and can come back to our conscious mind and then maybe from our conscious mind we can you know listen to people like yourself that have the message have the research have the data points to understand well coming into the conscious mind is just one step the next step then is to open the subconscious box and start to reprogram that right. i have a question for you bruce i'm actually right here in you know in this moment in beautiful Wisconsin, I was invited to host a, an event, a retreat for a company for the next five days. And my question is, how do you think, what's your point of view on how you know, business leaders can actually start to really, um, how can we empower business leaders to make impactful changes and build new types of conscious organizations? What do you think is the way to get there? And, and what are some of the levers we can pull on? Well, the most important thing is this. When, when business leaders get together, just say, let's say, uh, like a corporate boardroom where they're all sitting around. I say, when they're having conversation, where's that conversation coming from? I say, the creative conscious mind. That's where they're in the boardroom. Let's create. What do we want to create? We want to create happiness, wholeness, health, love. We want to create. Everybody's happy. And, and I say, that's great. Then I say, they go back to their office. And I say, then what happens when they're office? I go, they're not thinking. Now they're creating well they're thinking and now they're creating from the program and that's when the wishes and desires that were tossed about in the in the conscious room when everybody was talking wishes and desires no longer functions when they get back into the office because when they're back in the office they drop back into five percent thinking uh five percent uh uh control from the conscious mind 95 subconscious why because when they're office they're thinking what am I doing? Where am I writing? I go, yeah, but as you're doing that, your behavior is, is not coming from that conscious mind. Your behavior is now shifted to the subconscious program. How, was, how were you programmed? Where did you come from in your family life? Why? You will manifest this. So, for example, everyone uh, has been programmed with the belief that genes control the character of our lives. I go, no, no that's a total 100% false thing. Genes or blueprints. And I go, so what? And I say, well, blueprints don't control themselves. It's controlled by the architect. I go, well, then in the body, my genes are blueprints. Yeah, they're blueprints to make the body. But I then I say, well, who's the architect? I go, the mind is the architect. I go, so why is this important? Because it's the mind that is controlling the activity. And I say, which mind? 95%. 
subconscious mind. I say, well, what programs are those? Well, unfortunately, 60% are self-destructive. So uh, 60% of your processing while you're doing subconscious mind is disempowering you and uh, uh, and negatively influencing your in, your influence in the planet because now you're not being a positive sign, you're being a negative a- activist in the process. So uh, what can we do? And I say, well, the first thing is, how many people are aware that they're not creating their life with their conscious mind? Because everyone thinks, oh yeah, I'm creating this, uh, my wishes and desires, except I didn't, I didn't create this homeless problem. I, I didn't create this, uh, that's not my mind. I go, the program is. <laughs> The program you grew up with, that's just the way life is. And now all of a sudden, life is just the way it was when you learned it. I go, yeah. Uh, And the unfortunate part is you do not see your own programming. The reason simply is, is because why are you playing the program? The answer is because you're thinking, not paying attention. The program is running out. Everybody else sees your program. You don't see your program. So I say, well, in your mind, you have the wrong story. You're in the mind. I'm. I don't want these negative things. Why are they here? Because you didn't realize that while you were thinking about those things, your life was now being controlled by the invisible programs that everybody else is responding to. So we feel we are victims. Oh, yeah, that person got in my way, and that person messed me up, and this person did this, and I am just a victim. I go, no, you were creating this, and they're responding to your program. They didn't just come to you. You manifested a behavior that brought them to you. And yet 95% of the day as you're doing that, you are totally unaware that you even are participating. And so uh, it's the invisible quality that is causing the problem. How about if people become aware? What do you mean? I say, well, what if they learn that their life isn't coming you know, from that conscious mind, it's coming from the program subconscious mind. If I knew that, like I found out, then I say, well, then what can I do? Because your first question was, how do I change the damn program? I go, that is the name of the game. But how many people even know they have a program that they have to change? I go, very few people. Mm -hmm. Most people are operating. Step one is to make them aware or spread the message so the awareness can rise, right? There you go, Mr. Julian, whose job it is is to provide the knowledge so people can empower themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you for being in this dialogue with me. You know, I want to go back a little bit in time about, I think, whatever year we're in right now, 2024. So 12 years ago, I found your book, Biology of Belief. It was handed to me on... Back then, I mean, we, I think we already had like USB sticks, but it was handed to me in a, a CD, an audio CD to listen to. And like, however I made that happen, probably my computer at the time. And I ate it up, I think I, within like less than a day. Because once I got into the book, I was like, well, this is, this is a breakthrough knowledge. Everyone needs to hear about this, right? And, and so it, it affected my life tremendously because it allowed me to understand that um, investing time into researching my own subconscious programming of these first, you know, seven years and then understanding between uh, the, the reprogramming or psyche that you mentioned or, you know, recording something and playing it at night when the brain automatically goes into theta or other modalities that can bring us into theta if it's breath work, if it's hypnosis, right? I spent a lot of the, those years right after I found that book in, in that space to understand this could probably be a life-changing investment, maybe the most life-changing investment I can make. And and, you know, it, it does pay off. You know, it, it, it is exactly as you say. There is suddenly the conscious mind doesn't seem to be the only power that drives me towards what I desire, but it's like a, a bigger symphony. Um, yeah. Let's go well, back to the, the time when you wrote this, this book. The point, Julian, yeah. is you are yeah. where you are today because you put a program in to get to where you are today. You didn't mm-hmm. just fall into this and, hey, look where I am. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I say, that was no accident. You're a creator. We have to own it. This is where problems come from because when people look at their own lives and it's not working right, it's like, I didn't do that. I, I didn't do that. These people don't. I only that. do the good stuff. Yeah, That's, that's exactly right. Think. I'm responsible for the good stuff. I didn't do the bad stuff. I go, uh, folks, we're responsible for 100% of everything, good and bad, that is in our particular life. And you, if you don't own the bad, then you can't change the bad because you still think it's an outside issue when it really started inside. 
So uh, playing the role of victim, you will never come to the truth of the creator that's inside of you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I definitely want to talk more about, you know, empowering ourselves and others. Um, but to, to go back to this book, so this was based on your research that you made, um, you know, decades and decades and decades ago on epigenetics. And I think in the beginning days of that, it was not something that, you know, the scientific establishment was really equipped for or ready for. How was well, that for you? you know, when, not. <laughs> absolutely not, right? So how was it for you personally, Bruce? Like, how, how did you make it through this difficult time knowing you had found like kind of like a gold mine of human potential and understanding, you know, there's, there's, there's something there that will change the life of possibly even our entire species. And yet you get so much pushback. Uh, all of my colleagues looked at me and go, well, your work is artificial. Why? Because we all know that genes control life. All of us are working on genes. You're the only one that's not working on genes. What's wrong with you? And of course, they ignored everything I was talking about because they already have the vision. Genes turn on, genes turn off. They control your life. Let's identify the genes. Let's see how we can change the genes. And I'm going, it's not the genes. And I'm the only guy saying it. So obviously, I carry no weight <laughs> in the world of influence. Uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, you're at Wisconsin right now. That's where I was a professor in a medical school in Madison. And... Um, I started, you know, I was repeating my experiments. And the point about science, which they ignored, was science is based on prediction. And the fact was, I could say, I do this experiment today, and in three days, this is going to happen. And I could predict it. And the point is, nobody cared. But the fact was, well, how did I predict it? Because I saw the mechanism, but they didn't pay attention. I left the university. I walked out. I had tenure. I could have stayed there my whole life uh, and gotten paid my whole life. Even being an idiot, I could still get paid. Uh, and then one day I just said, I'm wasting my time because nobody cares. And they're so involved with where they're going. Why am I struggling fighting these people? So I resigned, which was, that's rare when a person with tenure walks out of the university and says, I don't want that job for life. <laughs> and... Uh, um, I started to, the big issue that they had with me was, well, explain how it works. I could explain the observation, but I couldn't explain the mechanism. And therefore, it was totally irrelevant to them. So I leave the university and I start working on this. And one of the big changes my whole life was I got into the nature of quantum physics. And everybody goes, oh, that's the weird physics. I go, yeah, it's totally weird. That's why none of my colleagues, including myself, have any knowledge of quantum physics. Why? That wasn't going to help us be biologists, for sure. We would fail, you know? It's like, ah. So I say, what's the point? Well, the point is this. Quantum physics is the most valid science on planet Earth. There is no science with more truth in it than quantum physics. And I go, so what the hell does that come to? And I say, principle number one, principle number one, quantum physics. From 1927, Max Planck, consciousness is creating our life experience. And that was from day one. And I go, but nobody teaches, uh, nobody in the health field even understands quantum physics. It's not relevant to them. And I go, it is, because it's, Physics is the mechanisms of how the universe works. And when as I started to read into the quantum physics, I started to realize, oh, my God, uh, how, the universe does not work by chemistry. It works by energy. <laughs> it's the invisible energy. And I go, and consciousness being that invisible energy is what shapes our physical reality. Einstein had a quote, and I'll bring it in because fundamental, Okay. Uh, in quantum physics, we talk about the invisible energy that we're in right now. Wherever you are, like Julian right now, you're in Madison, but guess what? In that room you're in right now, radio broadcasts are going through, television broadcasts are going through, cell phone broadcasts are going through, even solar energy, if you can't see it, is still going through. And I go, what, what's the point about this? So I say, you're immersed in an energy field. I go, field, the word field in physics means, you ready? Invisible moving forces that influence the physical world, the field, the invisible forces. So now let me give you that quote from Einstein, the critical one. The field is the sole governing agency of matter. I go, what the hell does that mean? 
It's the invisible field that has shaped our physical expression. I'll go, yeah, that's what 1927, the thought consciousness is the invisible field and it shapes the physical reality, okay? So once I started getting into this, the nature of the quantum physics, I started to look at it and then I understood the mechanisms of epigenetics and that the connection to the mind as the source of the field, which then engages, oh, little sidebar, field, invisible moving forces that influence the physical world, spirit, Invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. Quantum physics, even in an article published in Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal on the planet by a physicist, Richard Con Henry from, from uh, oh, Johns Hopkins University. He wrote an article in the most prestigious scientific journal called The Mental Universe. And I share it with my audiences because I don't give them the physics. I give them the conclusion. Richard Con Henry wrote this one sentence conclusion to the whole article. And the sentence reads, the universe is immaterial. Well, that's because quantum physics found out that atoms which make matter are actually made out of energy. So everything is made out of energy. So the quote, the universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual live and enjoy. And I go, oh my God. When I was in medical school, you couldn't even use the word mind because that was not part of medical school. And spirit was like, ah, you never say that word in medical school. And then I read this article in, in Nature, <laughs> the most prestigious scientific journal, saying it's mental and spiritual. I go, yes. And I was working on that level. And so I, I go back. I, I understand the mechanism now. I'm so excited because a cell is a programmable chip. I go, what do you mean? Well, it's got a nucleus. We're programs. It can become what? Skin, bone, muscle, brain. It can be anything. So the program is in the, in the genes. But the genes, the programs don't run the show. I found that the membrane, the skin, is reading the environment, taking that information in, and then selecting the genes to allow us to survive in the environment so our behavior fits the environment, okay? So... Uh, I start to give this understanding. It's like, oh my God, it's not the genes, folks. They, they don't turn on and off. It, it's the response to the environment. And that then corresponded with the fish. So I came back to Wisconsin because I needed a scientific audience to present this to. And I got so excited. I, I, I needed, I, I called my old chairman uh, and I said, I would love to give this talk. And I was sort of like, oh, you're the guy who left here. You know, they were not happy. They, but didn't, they gave, didn't remember you in the same way. <laughs> they gave me, they said, you can come and give a Wednesday lecture. Wednesday lecture is people bring their bag of lunch. They sit down. The faculty and the students are all in the room. They are BSing with each other. And some guy up in the front is trying to give a lecture. and Nobody gives a damn what he's talking about because they came for the social lunch. So they give me that. And I go, eh, okay, it's an opportunity. So I go in this room. All of my former colleagues, all of the students in graduate school are in this room. And I start giving a lecture about the membrane, the, the membrane controlling life, not the genes. And right near the end of the talk, it dawns on me when I look at the audience, nobody ate their lunch. They didn't even open the bags. They're sitting there looking at me with eyes like, like, who this guy just lifted and stepped out of a flying saucer or something. You know, they look at me in total like, total, what the hell is this guy? And I finished, uh, after I noticed this, like I got a little nervous there because I said, wow. Uh, and I finished and, and I say, thank you very much. Well, that's the response. I said, thank you very much. Everybody just sat there looking at me. Nobody moved. Nobody said anything. There was this longest pause of nothing. That, and I was standing up in the front going like this. And one guy, never forget, one guy way in the back of the room goes, twice, and they all looked at him, and he put his hands down, and then they were dead silent. And then, like an invisible conductor, they all got up, and they all walked out. Now, one of my former colleagues even stayed to ask me a question. I got nervous. I'll tell you why. Crazy people think they're right. <laughs> so all of a sudden I say, am I really crazy? I must be crazy. Look at all these people walked out on me. It's like, whoa, I must be crazy. I actually got so scared. 
I bought a ticket back to the University of Virginia where I got my PhD, and I met with some of the people who were on my PhD committee. And one of them was a world famous cell biologist, Lenny Rebin. And I'll never forget because I asked him, am, "Am I crazy?" You know, I said. So I'm in Le Lenny's room. He's got this big wing back chair, and he's sitting back in his chair, and I'm sitting in a little tiny chair in front of his desk. And I, I say, Lenny, let me give you my idea and tell me where I'm wrong. So I explain my idea of the cell membrane, the genes, blah blah blah. And he looks at me and he goes, uh, "It's not what we're thinking." I go, "Look, Lenny, I know it's not what you're thinking." Tell me what is wrong with the idea. And he goes, it's too simple. I started laughing. Now I am the crazy guy. I am laughing. He's looking at me like insane guy across, ah, ah, laughing. And I, I catch a moment and I say, sorry, Lenny. I say, my first week of graduate school, you taught us something called Occam's Razor. I said, what the hell is that? It's a statement that says, the simplest hypothesis is the most likely hypothesis and should be considered before any other hypothesis. So I sat there and I go, well, if the problem is it's too simple, thank you very much. And, uh, and then uh, later, the universe created all this. I have to tell you, I'm being led by the universe. I'm not even creating my path. The universe is opening the path. I got an invitation to give a lecture at Stanford Medical School. So I go there, and I remember I had two carousels of slides, one on my muscle research, cloning stem cells, which is great science, published research. It was really good. And another carousel on the new ideas. And I'm walking to the back of the room with a friend of mine who brought me there. <clears throat> and I said, Glenn, which one of these talks should I give? And he looked at me like, it's a no-brainer, Bruce. You want the job. You need the job. Put the cells down, the, the stem cell research. That's good. Talk about the stem cells, yeah. So I go, I'm at the projector, and guess what? My other arm puts the thing down. He looks at me like, what, are you crazy? And I realized, I said, well, if I can't talk about this, then I guess I don't really want to be here either. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I get in the front, and I talk about to, purpose, yeah. I see the audience. Guess what? Chairman of biochemistry. Chairman of pathology, chairman of biology, uh, uh, another chairman, I forgot which, which department that was in the medical school. And what was the point? They all do research on genes. <clears throat> and I'm talking about genes, you know? So um, I'm giving them my whole talk like I did at Wisconsin. <clears throat> and they're listening to me and I'm getting nervous because I'm coming near the end of the talk where reality has to hit me now. And I'm writing something on the board. And the truth is I'm downloading what I'm going to say before I say it. And I'm at the board writing this conclusion. And I hear in my mind that if you think genes are the end all of everything, well, you're no better than a fundamentalist. I start thinking, that's pretty funny. I turn around, say this to the audience. I, I was blown away. They started yelling at me. They were red-faced. They were apoplectic. They were angry. Angry. Why? They're all genetics research, and I'm calling, hey, genetic research is fundamentalism. And they were yelling at me, and it was like, oh, my God. And I'm, uh, and, uh, I'm watching all this. I even see the guy, uh, one guy in the second row, push the guy down in the first row so he could yell over him. And I'm watching all this going, and I hear in my mind a little voice going, oh, this job interview isn't going well. <laughs> <laughs> They're all yelling at me. I'm blowing up against a blackboard now. Mm. And, and I, speechless. And I start slipping down the blackboard and my belt catches on the chalk tray. That was a sign. Mm. The universe says, that's as low as you go. I yelled back. And the first thing I yelled was, there was life on this planet before there was DNA. And that and then a couple of other things. And the point was, yeah, there was life before there were genes. Explain that. And I just did. <laughs> and, and, and the biggest surprise of all, I say, thank you very much. And all of a sudden, they applaud. And I go, wow, what a surprise. They're applauded. Uh, the guy who brought me, the professor in, in dermatology, who brought me there, uh, gave me a, a list of the names of all these dignitaries. 
and said, after yeah. lunch, go and have a, an interview with each one of these. I pushed the list back and I said, Marv, I already yeah. <laughs> irritated them at this point. There's no reason to waste any more of their time. He pushed the list back. And he said, yeah, you you got them irritated, but you got them thinking. <laughs> and he says, go and talk to them. And I ended up getting the position as a senior scientist in the medical school at Stanford, carrying out the research and expanded it beyond where I was at the University of Wisconsin. So the universe set me up. And the significance was that I was 20 plus years ahead of science, talking about the new science called epigenetics when that science was only established by uh, in 1990 and I started in 1967. So I never let go of that in spite of the fact that I wasn't even in the university and just followed through. And the meaning of it led to the biology of belief, which is the understanding of how consciousness uh, is shaping our genetic activity and that we're not victims, which every, and this is a problem. Like what's the problem? I say, Everybody out there has been programmed by the belief of what? Oh, genes turn on and off and control your life. You didn't pick the genes as far as you know. You can't change them if you don't like the character. And then you hear they turn on and off. I say, what did we just program the public? They are victims of their heredity. That whatever genes they are, that's going to shape their life. And the genes control them. They don't control the genes. Victim, epigenetics, no. Your consciousness controls the gene, and you can change your consciousness. You can change your genes. We go from victim to master, and that's what the new science is all about. Absolutely, and you're you're one of those, you know, you know, breakthrough stewards of this breakthrough in in a certain way, right? Because you you helped so many millions of people to understand this. But the the funny kind of uh, overlap here is that yes, you can become conscious of your mind and then therefore influence your DNA, your epigenetics and trigger different, you know, genetic uh, mutations or expressions. But if you are run 95% by your subconscious and you never actually open the lid of the subconscious, very much it might look on the outside that you're just on a hereditary path, right? Because we got that program the first seven years. So it's really the interplay of both of them. The, you know, the understanding of epigenetics, the understanding of the conscious mind and the you know uh, expression of genetics as well as understanding as full creators as empowered creators we we must also uh, continue to put programs or rewrite programs of the subconscious it's like right. a thank you to mother and father thank you to our environment we grew up in you gave us around about a 40 percent of something that works you know and we know how to stand and we know how to walk and we know how to you know, eat and we know how to breathe, but, but in order to really become a conscious creator, we must go that extra mile. And I think that's where a lot of empowerment can happen, right? It's this understanding that we're not victims, but it's, it's not a done deal. Like you can't, you can't stop at age seven. You actually, as an adult, have to open that box again, open the lid, look in and realize, well, that's where I'm at today. Let's, let's, get, let's get to changing it. It's really important. A simple uh, observational knowledge that think about it is this. They follow the fate of what happens when a child is adopted into a family where there's cancer running through the lineage of the family. Because we always attribute it cancer because it runs in the family. It must be the genes that are connecting the family and therefore cancer genes. Well, the fact is this, uh, and, and this could be a wake-up call for many people out there. You ready? There's not one gene that causes cancer. There's no gene that if you have this gene, you automatically get cancer. Cancer is correlated with behavior. And I go, so wait, what happens to the adopted child when it's adopted into the family with cancer? The adopted child will get the same family cancer. The adopted child came from totally different genetics. Where'd the cancer come from? The programming caused cancer, not the gene. There's not one gene that if you have this gene, you automatically have cancer. It's your program and dysfunctional programming that will engage the cancer gene. And I go, so why is this important? Well, we're still of the mindset, genes control this, let's kill the cancer cells and everybody's going to be happy. I go, the cancer cells were already converted. You can kill all those you want. You haven't gotten to why I had the cancer cell in the first place, because that was where the consciousness interfere with the genetic activity. And so if you want to get rid of cancer, it's not killing the cancer cells. It's changing the consciousness that was dysfunctional that put you out of harmony with life. 
That's what caused cancer. 90% or more of heart disease, no genetic linkage. It's lifestyle. 100% of diabetes type 2, no genetics, lifestyle, okay? That we're beginning to find that the illnesses and like cancer, 90% of cancer, there is no connection in the family of the person who got the cancer with anybody else in the family that nobody else got the cancer. They created it. It didn't come from a family. All of this comes down to the part, if the people become aware of this, they have to ask the question, then, then how come my life isn't what it is? It's, it, I've been blaming it on genes. Oh, yeah, you got the gene that causes this problem. You got the gene that causes that problem. You got the alcohol gene. You're going to get to be an alcohol. It's like there's no alcohol gene, man. It's behavior. And that you can change. Genes, you got them, baby. But the mind can rewrite the genes. That's epigenetics. And I say, first story, the program everybody's got, I'm a victim of my heredity. Victim is the key. Epigenetics says, no, if I change my consciousness, I can change my genetics. I go, well, well you're the one that can change consciousness. <gasps> well, then I'm not a victim. I'm a master. That is the whole revolution is let go. I'm a victim and own the reality. I'm the creator. Because then, and only then, are you empowered. If you if you buy victim, that means victim means powerless, and that's where most people are in today's world. Absolutely, and I mean we've seen layers and layers of that over the last thousands of years, but last hundred of years, even you know last fifty years, last ten years, we've seen these layers of you know us as humanity confronting this victimhood, realizing you no, know, we must come into sovereignty. We must come into a relationship with self, with consciousness, with other, with the field, so we can actually change the reality that's lived on planet Earth. And well, it takes yeah, a, we can a tremendous it, amount we, of courage. But, uh, but you, as you said, we can change the reality that's in front of us by first adding the fact that we manifested the reality that's in front of us, and we're the ones that can change that reality. Because if you believe victim, which is what the programming is, you're a victim of your heredity. Oh, victim means I'm powerless. Uh, and I say, when a person perceives himself to be powerless, they will give up their power. I'm powerless, and buy and buy, pay money for somebody else to give them the power. So uh, you know, uh, in my recent lectures, I, I put up a slide. It's called uh, the. Uh, it's oh, it's, a, it's about power monger, those that seek power. I say the power monger's credo. I go, what's that? The power monger's credo is give them the poison for free and then sell them the antidote. And I go, that's exactly how they controlled us. Look, the church came up with hell. Actually, the church didn't come up with hell. It was Greek mythology. Somebody started to talk Greek mythology about hell. Then people started to believe it. And then all of a sudden they found out because the church was claiming God talks to them. God, and so they're going to have to listen. The church says, oh, you don't follow the rules. You're going to go to hell. How much do I have to pay to learn the rules? Well, that was called tithing. That was 10% of your salary had to go to the church to keep you from going to hell. Yeah, but they created hell. <laughs> and then they sold you the resolution. And then I said, but that's old stuff. We, we have the same thing happening now. I go, what's that? There's a belief, and it's incorrect, that the COVID virus was lethal. No, the COVID virus was not lethal. It's a belief, okay? I'll get into that if we want to. But the point about it is what? They give us the COVID virus. It was created. And then they sold us the resolution. It's called the vaccine. I go, they saw, oh, no, isn't the vaccine free? Everybody said the vaccine's free. Go get it. I go, what? Oh, Pfizer gave you a billion dollars worth of vaccine for free? Come on, wake up, folks. You paid for the vaccine. And now you're going to use it. Why? Because they scared the hell out of you to get the vaccine. I want to, you know, I, I'd say that particular part of the recent history, it's, it's quite obvious. It's quite visible. You just have to, to look. And you said a very interesting sentence there. And that's like, you know, unless you break the rules. So I think to a certain degree, we, we need to be courageous enough to understand, is this a moment where I'm, where I'm here to play with the rules, not play by the rules? And I think in a certain way, if you look at your history and your story of 
how you had to confront the scientific establishment and the genetic research is you had to break some of the rules, right, Bruce? Like if you only follow the book every single day, you might end up in the same place of victimhood. So to a degree, when we, when we arrive in what you said, mastery, or we arrive in conscious ability as creators, we have to understand that rules are meant to play with, not to play by. Exactly. And the unfortunate part is when you're scared because the rules also tell you, well, there's a consequence if you don't follow the rules that you're going to be, you're going to die. You can bet how many people say, tell me what the rules are. Uh, 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 you know, I really want to bring it up because you're giving me a platform for a moment. And as simply as this, we as individuals in this world only have power in a community. No individual can go out in the street and say, change the world and the world changes. But if thousands of people go in the street, then we can change the world, okay? The COVID story scared us and fear. And people, there were a number of people who were rightly afraid. Now I'll tell you why, because we blame the COVID for the serious illness. And reflection back now, those people that got seriously ill were already ill before the virus got here. Most of them had heart issues. Most of them were stress sufferers. Most of them had diabetes. Most of them were obese. I go, the COVID virus was more like a wolf. I go, what do you mean? I go, well, the wolf doesn't just kill anybody in the herd. The wolf finds the weakest one. It never goes to the strongest one, it goes to the weakest one. So what did the COVID virus do? It called the herd. It said, look how many people are not living in health and harmony on this planet. And those people that are so far off, that virus pushed them over the line, they paid for it, okay? So I'm not saying people didn't die. I said they did, but they didn't die directly from the virus. They died because they were already compromised before the virus, okay? So that's that's it. But, but the issue about what was more important about it was it scared people. And when people are afraid, they give up their power. And I said, we only have power in community. Guess what happened during COVID? No community. Essentially, the whole world had no community. I say, what do you mean? Put on a face mask, separate, don't talk to each other, keep away from each other. I go, then what happened to community? I said, there was no more community. I said, then what was the result? People, population, no power. We followed the power of some handful of people who I'm not very fond of, <laughs> especially Fauci. Uh, and the whole world accommodated that belief system. No question. No, no, don't do it. Anybody who questioned, like even me, I got you know blackballed on YouTube a couple of my lectures because I questioned the story, uh, uh, and the dis uh, the, the the dozen you know the disinforming dozen were all canceled because they were antagonistic to the story that was being pushed on us, when the reality was. It was an exercise. I go, what do you mean? I said, well, the COVID was given to you for free, the vaccine you paid for, and you didn't realize the other thing, and that was we lost power as a population on the planet. It was run by a handful of people. All of the people conformed to do exactly what these people said. I said, there was no power. And, and the idea is, there's this is happening for a reason because my book on spontaneous evolution reveals the fact that even NASA has now emphasized this civilization we're in is killing itself, it's collapsing, it's falling apart. That we are, it's irreversible collapse, which means either of two things either it just collapses and we're done, or as it collapses, we build the better one. That's really the destination, okay. And to do that, we have to do that as a community of people, not hand the power to a few. And that's the that's the big takeaway from, you know, the COVID opportunity in that sense is the takeaway is we have power as community. We have power when we, we don't give over our individual power, but we stand sovereign. Right. And we we think we reflect. We don't let the, the fear um, that is, you know, being you know played at us take over our agency and you know, I mean, there is maybe a scenario for fear when you're actually facing off the saber-toothed tiger. Ah, uh, the a real whole one. Other story. That's a whole other story, right? That's a real fear because you're really facing a physical yeah. danger right in front of you. But the takeaway really, and you, Bruce, you said it so beautifully, is we have power as humans in our, our superpower is collaboration, is community, is coming together and understanding what can we create together. And I, I think 
maybe, just maybe, these kind of triggering events over the last year has allowed more and more and more people to onboard into this understanding and realize, well, so what stops us then from building the more beautiful world we want to build? And I'm, uh, I have a question on that for you, which is, yeah, please. you know, in your, in your best words, you know, I know, I know you've, you've started out as a scientist in the beginning of your journey, maybe spirituality wasn't the biggest meaning, but it, it turned into a very spiritual journey, right? So yeah. what is your wish, your desire, your, um, yeah, your spiritual download in that sense for the evolution of humanity? What do you, what's your dream for planet Earth as we're standing here and we're, we're about to embark into yeah. probably really uncharted territory? Well, the, the part is this. Almost everybody out there has already touched what the future reality can be. And I say, what was it? I say, falling in love. I say, why? Because when you fell in love and you experienced the honeymoon, I say, what did you create? The honeymoon is each individual's experience of heaven on earth. Whatever that honeymoon was, it was heaven on earth. I say, that was no accident. You created that. I say, well, how'd you do that? I say, you stopped thinking. You let stop playing the program. So I say, what's the point? I say, what's the future? I say, you manifested heaven on earth. You, you, why don't, you can have that every day for your whole life. Not the little short period that we call the honeymoon, gone. What if you had a honeymoon every day of your life? I go, well, then planet Earth is heaven on Earth. I go, that is the secret. I go, what do you mean? We have been programmed with a belief that if you do you know, well here according to the scriptures, you will have an opportunity to go to heaven and be creative because heaven is creative. Everybody's got their own interpretation. That's, that's, that's your version of heaven. Okay. I go, wait a minute. <laughs> what what caught, got to me, and it's kind of funny because – I, when I recognized spirituality, listen, I was not spiritual, zero, spiritual, zero. And I saw the mechanism, which is a set of uh, receptors on your cell that are picking up an energy field that's unique to you. No two people have the same set of these receptors. Each of us is receiving a broadcast. And so the analogy is the body is like a television set. And the antennas called self-receptors are picking up your identity. And no two people have the same set of these receptors. So no two people are on the same wavelength. I go, so what's the point about this? I go, we are the field. And that goes back to the physics. It's the field that creates the reality. We are a spirit, which is a field. And we're playing through this body. So I say, the body is like a television set. The broadcast is spirit. I go, so what's the point? I say, well, you're watching TV and it breaks. And we say, oh, the TV's dead. I go, yeah, TV's dead. doesn't work anymore. Question, is the broadcast still there? And he goes, of course the broadcast is still there. I say, how would you know? And I say, well, you could get another TV and tune it to the station. And it's back on the show again. I go, ah, well, that means if the body as a television dies, the broadcast of who we are is still there. We never died. The broadcast's still there. I say, and if a body in the future shows up with the same set of these self-receptors that I have, then I will be re in a new television. I go, yeah. I say, does it make a difference to male or female TV? I go, no, that's the TV. You're the broadcast. Does it make a difference if it's white, brown, black, red, yellow? I go, no, no, that's the TV. We're the broadcast. If people start to recognize we're the broadcast, then the individual separation based on uh, sex and race and all that is irrelevant. Those are television sets. We are not the TVs, okay? So the moment this hit me, I go, oh, my God, I can't die. Why? I'm not in here. I'm the broadcast. And I got so excited. But then my scientific mind clicked in. I said, then why have a body? Why not just be the spirit? And that's what I, I joke. I say, that's when I found I had what are called Jewish comedian cells. I go, what do you mean Jewish comedian cells? I say, uh, 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 Jewish comedian cells answer a question with a question. Yeah. I ask, <laughs> why have both a spirit and a body? Why not just be a spirit? 50 trillion Jewish comedian cells welled up and the answer came into my head from the body and it said this, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? Now, you got to think that baby out. I'll tell you what it is. The body is a virtual reality suit. It takes in vibrations and makes vision out of brain. 
It takes in vibration, makes sound. It takes in vibration, makes flavor and taste and smell. These are all vibrations. Love is a vibration. And I go, oh my God, this is a virtual reality suit. What does it do? It, it gives us sensations. Love, <laughs> fear, <laughs> whatever it is, it's giving us sensations. And it goes back to source because I can put a probe out here and read your brain function. It's called MEG, magnetoencephalograph probe. Doesn't touch your head, but it reads your brain function. Your brain functions are being broadcast back to the source. And I said, oh, what does this mean? And my life, boom, changed. You know why? Because I said, we came here to have experiences. What is love? What is chocolate? What's a landscape? What's a sunset? I go, and I go, and we have a virtual reality suit. And I also said, but wait, we also move through this world and we can do what we want to create. We can become, you, you're the, the becoming of a voice of reason in a time of chaos. <laughs> we are becoming things. I go, wait a minute, then we're creating this life. I go, yeah, we're creators. I said, you don't die and go to heaven. You were born here. Why? Because you can manifest. Whatever your vision of heaven was, was a vision that you thought you could manifest. I say, you could any manifest, you are, you are here. And all of a sudden I said, oh my God, people are wasting their lives. Why? They're waiting to go to heaven and they miss the opportunity of what is heaven? Manifestation, creation. I go, oh yes, that's what we're doing here. Yeah, but it's not working. I go, well, that's because your program that you're manifesting with isn't supporting you. Change Word. the program. Yeah. And the honeymoon is you change the program in the honeymoon enough that in 24 hours after meeting that other person, your world changed in front of exactly. your face. And I go. Exactly. And that's the shortcut, right? The shortcut is the honeymoon. The shortcut is like all spiritual teachings come back to just love. Love is the frequency in which we are ultimately Wait master creators. And of course, there are days and there are moments when that's pretty difficult. But, but ultimately, that is, that is the challenge in the sense perceiving uh, body suit. You call it the virtual reality suit, right? It's, it's quite fascinating how you've, you've, ra you've reveled your entire thinking capacity around it and you have such an eloquent way to share it. I've been <laughs> like, happy, completely, completely with you for the last hour and a half. I'm a happy boy. Why? As my book started out, when uh, before all this, you asked me, who do you want to be? And I would say, anybody but me. And now, with all the stuff that I've learned and experienced and how I, I say, who do I want to be? I say, I want to be me. Why? Because I'm creating a life that, I'm, it's beautiful. The world is crazy. I don't live in crazy. I create my own environment. I, I have people like you in my life. I don't have the crazy people in my life. And I go, well, that's a creation. I go, yes, but everybody can have this, except they're missing some very important points about who they are and who they think they are. And those programs by other people have taken advantage of them. As I said, it's 400 years old since the Jesuits said, give me a child till they're seven, I'll show you the man. Well, we're programming all the kids now before they're seven and taking away their power. The schools are not empowering us to become creative. The schools are empowering us to rote memorize. Memorize the equation. Memorize this. Memorize this. How about creativity? I don't know when you went to school, Julian, but when I went to school, we had art classes. We had music classes. We had shop where we learned how to fix and make things. We, we had uh, drafting, how to create blueprints, all these creative things. Today, fun. And today they don't have those courses because like music, it's not going to help you with science. So we have science, technology, engineering, math, STEM. What about creativity? None. I say, what's the result? This is right in our face, right here. I'll tell you why. When I was younger, the U.S. was number one in everything technological on the planet. We had the best infrastructure. We had the best systems. We were the most creative. All the people on the planet, all the new technology, all that stuff started here in the U.S. Today, we're about number 30 in Western nations in creativity. I go, what do you mean? I say, it's other people in other countries that are creating. We're just lagging. I say, why are we lagging? Because we lost the education to enhance creativity. 
we don't even use creativity. Just remember this fact and say it back, and then you pass the course. And it's like, and I go, well, then what happened? I say, we're a failing nation because, uh, there, th- let me add this to everybody's audience. They should know this. There's a phrase called use it or lose it. And we used to think, oh, that's the muscles. I build them up. I make them strong. I stop using them. They go away. Use it or lose it. I go, every system in the human body is based on use it or lose it. When we were young, we had the opportunity to become creative if exercised to become creative. But we never use that exercise anymore. Now it's just memorize this and memorize that and memorize this. And I say, what about creativity? We fail to exercise it. We don't use it. We have lost it. And it's time for us to turn around and say, oh, my God, time to reprogram because we have (laughs) the movie The Matrix, science fiction. Yes, everybody's programmed. Yes, there is a red pill falling in love. But I'll never forget Morpheus uh, was asked the question, so why are we here? What what does The Matrix want? And he holds up a battery. He says he wants to turn people into batteries energy sources use their energy and and basically yeah we are a workforce but not an intelligent force and this is why your program to me is and again i keep emphasizing because you give me a chance to talk on a platform to this audience and the audience you are creating is an audience that is seeking the answers to how do i get out of this mess and create the world we want your audience by definition julian you know, are cultural creatives and you're a leader in helping them become creators so thank you for letting me be here to emphasize to them you are creators and if we you are creators to- and we're creators together thank you bruce so much for your time for your wisdom for your insights for your work over the last decades on in this world it's, it's truly meaningful. It's definitely changed my life. Like the, the moment I picked up that book, which, you know, came to me in CD format, but it changed my life. And, you know, I, 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 sure, I sure know it has for many other people. Uh, you made a really clear point about, you know, being empowered, stepping into that, that agency, the, the mastery, the, the understanding that we're more than, than victims to the genes, the victims to our programs. And I think you made a beautiful brilliant point here at the end about creativity in schools right and allowing children especially zero to seven but really all of us no matter how old we are the childlike nature within us to be creatively expressed and to play in a creative realm that that is a a resolution that we desperately need at this time thank you for listening to me julian Uh, and i want to thank your audience because i'm happy to speak to this audience because they're here looking Give me a different way to live on this planet. And thank you for providing so many different speakers, offering each insights of how can we do this better? Amazing. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. 